It's my real pleasure and honor to introduce today's uh, speaker, um, Hilka Novotny, uh, and it's really time that we have you out here at ISD Austria give a talk. Uh, Helga is, of course, one of the most preeminent social scientists dealing with topics uh, related to science, technology, and research. Uh, she's born in Vienna, uh, studied law in Vienna, uh, then got a second doctorate in sociology at Columbia University under Paul Lazarsfeld. Um, she had a long and distinguished career. I just mentioned a few uh, stops on the way. She was a professor at the University of Vienna and then a professor of science and technology studies at ETH Zurich. Uh, there, uh, she, in Zurich, she was not only professor at ETH, but she, she especially um, uh, dealt with several initiatives uh, that uh, brought together young scientists also from different disciplines. She was a director of the Collegium Helveticum in Zurich, and she initiated, uh, together with, uh, with the donor, Branko Weiss, uh, Society in Science Fellowships. That, uh, it, this is still a very active fellowship program in Switzerland. Um, so she's really predestined to, to speak to us about uh, this topic of science and society. Uh, after retirement, I'm not sure I'm looking forward to this kind of retirement. The, the list of, of, of active duties <laughs> is still pages. She's currently a visiting professor at NTU in Singapore. Um, and she's chair of, uh, of the ERA Council Forum Austria, which advises the Austrian government on topics in science and uh, research. Uh, she was, of course, also very active uh, advising uh, the European Union, uh, first as chair of the European Research Advisory Board, which uh, gave, uh, gives advice on, uh, on research topics to the European Commission, and then uh, as vice president and president of the uh, European Research Council. Uh, that is, of course, all dear to our hearts here. Uh, it is really difficult to summarize this CV. Uh, I, I just now really uh, make it very short. She has eight academy memberships so of national academies, seven honorary doctorates, uh, about a dozen books, including, I think, the latest one is The Cunning of Uncertainty, a very interesting read, if interested. And uh, so, uh, without further ado, welcome. Erika, we are really looking forward to your talk. The <clears throat> history, uh, this is a famous sentence that goes back to the wars in ancient Greece. History is written by the winners. And it highlights the point that the standpoint from which history is written matters. But something that is also important to remind ourselves that we ask questions to history, questions that always come from the present in which we live now. The present shapes our questions, but we are engaged in a dialogue with the past, and sometimes with something that is completely different. The past was, in some instances, of course, like the present, but in many ways it was very different. And if you look at this uh, compilation just of concepts up here, these concepts would have been ununderstandable to many, many people living in the past. They would not know what to do with these concepts. And, <clears throat> of course, the human past um, has always been a history between conflict and cooperation. What else have humans done? Well, it started with agriculture in a much more primitive way than what you see here. It started with the domestication of animals. And there are many theories that connect the way how agriculture has changed society and the social structure. Um, I will not go into it, but this is just a reminder that we have built ecosystems. And we have built ecosystems by manipulating our environment, by changing our environment. And in the picture below, 
you see one of these many pictures taken from space and how light and information on the globe show us the way how we are connected now. But this is another way of looking at our ecological niche. It's this tiny, tiny crust that you see around this illustration of the Earth on which we live. And this is all we have. This is our ecological niche. As you know, worms built their niche, octopuses built their niches, and this is the niche that we have, and it's the only one that we have. So one way of looking at this um, is to ask ourselves about the human impact, which in a way is the downside of conquering our ecological niche, because we have been intervening, we have been shaping it, and we are also threatening the very environment that we are dependent on for our own survival. The Anthropocene, um, as, as you know, is a concept that has gained traction recently. Originally, it was Paul Crutzen, an atmospheric chemist, who mentioned it in a talk uh, some dec two decades ago almost, saying that we have entered the age of the Anthropocene. Namely, we are now reshaping the Earth on which we live. And this concept has um, become rather popular, but in order to make it a real scientifically acknowledged concept, you need the geologists, who are the ones who are in charge of delineating and defining the ages of the Earth on which we live. And the geologists have certain criteria for the delineation of the different eras and what you learned in school about uh, the many eras of the world with all these strange terms that we all have forgotten since. But the geologists need physical traces on the earth and changes that show that indeed we have entered a new era. And so <clears throat> the International Union of Geological Sciences has put up working groups to see can we find such beginnings, traces in the Earth, physical traces, where we can say indeed a new era has started. There are several competing attempts to find such markers, but one that probably um, has a great likelihood of making it are is the radioactivity that was unleashed by the first atomic bomb uh, trials in the 1940s in the last century. And as radioactivity is very long living, we still find these human-generated traces of radioactivity that date back to these first trials. There are other attempts. People have looked at um, the uh, trade of animals, of uh, plants coming from uh, Latin America, basically intercontinental transfers that again changed uh, the way how people live and um, <clears throat> which animals are around, etc. But this is one way of trying also to establish scientifically that indeed we have changed um, the, um, the Earth. And seen from inside, what do we see? What do we experience? I think the most important change is that nature, which was so threatening for many, many generations before us, is now seen as something that needs to be protected from us. And this is one of the many changes connected to the Anthropocene. <coughs> But it's not only <clears throat> um, the Earth, it's also time that uh, keeps changing our concepts of time. And there are different ways of uh, experiencing time. But the most basic that we all share, indeed, that we share with all living creatures on Earth, has to do with our circadian uh, clock, the internal mechanism which is not exactly 24 hours, this is why it's called circadian, 
And um, it gives us day and night, uh, awakeness and our sleep. And it's life on Earth adapted to the rotation of the planet. That's the explanation. But these gentlemen here uh, received <coughs> uh, the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 2017 for proving <coughs> the exact molecular mechanisms that control this circadian rhythm. When I say there are different notions of time, I want to contrast this biological time, which also means, sometimes it's referred to as the arrow of time, because as living beings, we move from birth to death. So there is a direction in which biological time moves, which is not true for physics, and also there is something that is social time. We have different notions of temporalities, and I will come back to that, because across cultures and across also our own history, the notions of time have changed. And what is the past, the present, and the future are notions that keep changing in different formations of, of society. And here you see um, a clock that has to be adjusted. The human, uh, um, the human lifespan is expanding, but uh, I think uh, whatever the transhumanists claim, I think the human lifespan is still limited. And all this means that we are rooted in the present. We have a notion of the past. Science and technology enables us to look back in the past, discover more and more. We live in the present and we are caught in the present because all the images that come to us from the past are interpreted by us as living in the present, but we are blind for the future. The future... The future cannot leave traces. We do not have a memory of the future, but we crave to find out more about it. We want to predict it. On the right side, you see one of the many, many um, ways how our ancestors wanted to predict the future. It's called divination. And it was, practiced, it was practiced in all cultures around the world that we are aware of. But some <clears throat> divinations were more sophisticated than others. This one is a shoulder blade, most probably from a sheep from China. It's very, very old. And <clears throat> by now, it is also known that there was a specific technology uh, that underpinned this kind of divination, namely these shoulder blades were heated and then cracks appeared um, in the blade and the persons who predicted the future were able to read it. How did they do it? Well, <clears throat> by now, historians of this period of Chinese history tell us that they had a special status inside the Chinese court of those times. So they were in close contact with those whom they advised and telling their future. So there was also a social skill involved, not just the technology. You had to be able to know the temperature of the fire. You had to know how the cracks uh, were produced, how to interpret the cracks, but you also needed the social skills to have a feeling of what is it the ruler wanted to hear. Today, we don't practice divination anymore, but we still have all these many, many reports and forecasts that tell us what the world will be like 10 years, 20 years, 40 years from now. And all this comes because we are blind to the future, and yet we crave to know more about it. So the future is uncertain, but the future is also open. And this openness of the future was a major discovery that came relatively late. 
It came to Europe uh, only in the 17th, 18th century. There is one particular period that the um, historian Reinhard Koselik calls the Sattelzeit in German, the saddle time between 1750 and 1850, when all of a sudden people started to realize the future is not predetermined. It has not been set by some mysterious force or by God or gods, sometimes in an eternal space. It's not fate that determines the way how people live, but the future is open. And to some degree, it can be shaped through human action. And this is, in a way, underpinning modernity. It's underpinning the way how we look at the world today, knowing that we, it will um, evolve also in the future. And in my book that uh, Tom mentioned, uh, The Cunning of Uncertainty, I also um, describe this openness, this feeling and this experience, the future of being open, as being one of the major social inventions of uh, humankind. And with it goes uh, an empowerment also of what humans can do and how not only science but also society can cope with uncertainty. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned already <clears throat> cultural evolution has overtaken biological evolution. And by this uh, I mean that humans <clears throat> have been successful in overtaking uh, other species. They have uh, developed knowledge not only of tools and technologies, but also knowledge embedded in science. And something that Aristotle uh, some 2,000 years ago called phronesis as part of knowledge <coughs> phronesis for him was practical wisdom. So we need technologies, we need science, but we also need something like practical wisdom in order to know what to do with the knowledge and the technology that we as humans uh, create. Now, the main driving force between, uh, behind this cultural evolution undoubtedly is science and technology. Now, of course, in the old ancient civilizations, there was also scientific knowledge, there was mathematics, there was geometry that had been invented, um, and yet, Modern science is a relatively recent social invention. Goes back, here you see an image of, of Galileo, who was the first to say the book of nature has, is written in mathematics. And this became the basis for the development of science in the, in the 16th and 17th century. But then, when I say two social inventions connected to modern science, I mean the following. One is undoubtedly the experimental <coughs> method. This meant no longer just to follow what was written in the ancient texts, but to set up in an empirically uh, controllable way questions for which you could find answers because you could control the experiment. And so you would slowly, slowly get answers, get answers to the questions you were asking. But then there was another social invention that happened at that time. And this can be seen in the way how the Royal Society in London in the 17th century was dealing with these experiments. And it was not only there, there were other academies set up in the major capitals of Europe. And <clears throat> this meant the experiments had to be repeated in public. So it was not just in the lab doing something there and then coming out and claiming, now we understand better how the vacuum pump works or whatever the experiment was about. But you wanted to demonstrate it in front of the public. And the public was regarded as witnesses. Now, who were the witnesses in those times? And this is where, again, you have to understand that history is 
in those times something different. They had to be gentlemen. And gentlemen meant they were only men. So women were excluded from being able to witness and give their witness statement. But also they had to have a certain self-employed fortune. You had to be economically independent. And that was the reason why women were excluded, because they were economically dependent on their fathers or on their husbands. So this is just an aside, but it shows <clears throat> that this idea to involve the public and to have social witnesses that uh, can uh, indeed testify to what they saw happening in the experiment was another social invention. And then from the mid-19th century onwards, science and technology came closer and closer together. And since that time, we speak about science-based technologies. Before, you had two different streams, technologies developing in certain ways, science developing in other ways. But from then on, uh, science-based technologies were making a major impact. And this can be seen in terms of the many <clears throat> interventions and innovations that happened and that were changing um, uh, cultural practices. The book by Tim Har Harford here has 50 <coughs> examples how these technological inventions were changing the way how people live, starting with bottle milk, uh, the light bulb, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, we take it for granted that this is part of our technical civilization in which we live today. But still, I would like to make um, a distinction between invention and innovation. Invention, a novel idea coming from an individual, usually within a network. There are no lone geniuses, but even the geniuses are connected to other people. But um, innovation means this idea is also taken up in society. Sometimes or very often it's commercialized, it hits the market, and new functions arise from these kind of, um, of innovations. And this is inseparable with the production of culture. You see here one of the thousands pictures of, of Mona Lisa. Um, art historians like Isaacson tell us Leonardo da Vinci, whose 500th um, death we celebrate uh, this year, he was interested in finding out the muscular movements around the mouth that produce a smile. And so it was the scientific curiosity behind the, this famous icon of Mona Lisa that drove Leonardo da Vinci to paint it the way how he painted it. We also know that the most innovative hubs today are in urban cities, in, in, in urban environments, mega cities sometimes. And it raises the question about cultural heritage. What is it about the past that we want to preserve? And what is it we have to discard? something that all of you who are working with data encounter on a daily basis, and we as society will encounter more and more what to do with the many data and what to consign to the trash bin and what to preserve and how to preserve it. And last but not least, um, Biology has given us this wonderful new tool, <clears throat> CRISPR, in, its, very, in its, its different variants, that allows us for the first time to edit the genetic uh, heritage with which we and plants and animals are born and to improve on the natural um, heritage. So all these are... <clears throat> Uh, wonderful developments that have occurred. Of course, there are questions to be raised as well, because none of this 
culture, science, technology <coughs> exist in a vacuum. We have to take the societal context into account. We have to ask what kind of regulations do we have, do we need, do we want, what kind of governance, and last but not least also uh, we are very much aware that we live today in a global world and in a globalized economy and also the way how the culture is globalizing. But then <clears throat> there is this challenge of unintended consequences. And I could not help but uh, sh uh, show to you this wonderful quote by Sidney Brenner, Nobel laureate, um, in physiology and medicine, who pays tribute to mathematics as dealing with the perfect, physics with the optimal, and biology only with the satisfactory, but never mind. And I could not help to add, because he did not think about the social sciences, social science deals with the messy. And these are the unintended consequences that arise because we are unable to foresee the many interconnections. It's the way how complexity arises, as you know, from interconnecting properties, interconnecting links that exist in any complex adaptive system, and we are unable to foresee them, and hence we are not very good in dealing with them. It is true, um, science uh, and technology, again, help us to see a little bit further, but we are far away from being uh, in control. And these are just some of the images. Um, we are not in control. Um, new anxieties arise regarding climate change. We have global challenges. Uh, traffic jams uh, are played out in different ways in different parts uh, of the world, but plastic seems to be a bit everywhere. And close to home, we also see, despite all these wonderful achievements that we got from science, from technology, inventions, innovations, we see threats and we see some kind of falling back into what uh, we thought has been overcome in the process of modernization, in the process of the Enlightenment, um, giving us a solid basis of values and of a worldview. Now, this poses also some questions to scientists. How much do you get involved, not just with society, where you want to share your knowledge, but also with politics, with power? And again, going back to the 17th century, the Royal Society, there was one very important deal that was made at that time that, in my view, influenced scientists ever since. And the Royal Society in London had a, a written agreement with the monarchy, the monarch, what they were allowed to do and what not. Now, they were not called scientists uh, in those days, they were called experimental philosophers, but they needed um, to exchange the knowledge they had gained with their colleagues in Berlin or in Paris or in St. Petersburg, and therefore they needed to write letters. But under the monarchy, there was censorship. So they had to argue and to bargain, we need to be exempt from the normal kind of censorship so that we can freely communicate with each other across Europe. Then they were interested and needed to um, cut up corpses. If you wanted to see what is inside a body, there were no scans in those times. You had um, to use brute force. And again, this was something that by religion was not allowed or at least was under some kind of prohibition. So these experimental philosophers had to get an exemption again to be able to do that. And there were a few other things. 
But then what was it they had to give in return? And here it comes. They had to promise not to meddle in politics, not to meddle in rhetorics, and not to meddle in theology. Theology may seem obvious to us. Rhetorics is no longer on the agenda, although if you look at the way how public relations and public events and message control and all that is run, has a lot to do with rhetorics. And not to meddle in politics meant that scientists retreated and made this division. This is our way of doing things, and we do not want and are not allowed to meddle in politics. And the question, of course, um, when do you need to get involved in politics? And there were <clears throat> instances also in the past, as there are now, instabilities and tipping points. John von Neumann, by the way, one of the fathers of the, the, the computer, the maniac that he helped develop in Princeton in the um, um, early 50s, he wrote an interesting article in 1955 with the surprising title, Can We Survive Technology? And what he meant, he was very much preoccupied with uh, nuclear weapons in those days. This was the most advanced technology in that time, and nobody knew how they would be used. And John von Neumann argued, um, we have now reached a point in human development where the space can no longer be extended. He disregarded time because he said we have limitations, physiological limitations. So time cannot be further um, compressed. And he was worried uh, about a nuclear <coughs> conflict because the Earth was limited, the space could not be expanded, people could not go to another continent anymore. And this is why he posed the question, can we survive um, technology? But this leads us to the question that I have already introduced with regard to the Anthropocene planetary limitations. And the planetary limitations also point to a question, how are we going to deal with the fear of the future that grips so many people today? People are afraid. Uh, there are continuously services that are being done. One of the most recent services, people are preoccupied and fear climate change. They fear pollution. They fear um, everything that comes with climate change, of course. And yet, you know, we, seen from the point of view of science, have somehow to deal with that and not uh, allow people to retreat into this state of fear. Because once you are fearing something, you see no alternatives. You don't see a future, you don't see an escape, you just withdraw and you are stifled uh, by fear. So this is one of the challenges that we have. And let me just um, add, when I was writing my book, The Cunning of Uncertainty, one of the main reasons why I wrote it was how I was so much struck with the way how scientists deal with uncertainty and the way how the public and politicians deal with uncertainty. For scientists, uncertainty is something that is even attractive because scientists thrive on the cusp of uncertainty. You do not know as yet, but you want to go further. You want to find out. And for many politicians, um, uncertainty is seen as threatening. They want very clear answers, yes or no. Is this substance cancerous, yes or no? But if you're honest as a scientist, you can only say yes under the condition that or no under the condition that. And politicians nor our media are often very much interested in this fineness of such differentiations. Under which conditions is it the case? And with which probabilities is it the case? Now, <clears throat> 
one way <clears throat> forward may be to combine these two discourses that we are engaged in, a discourse on digitalization, and I realize that I have to hurry up a bit, uh, and the other one on the Anthropocene. And the question is here, to what extent can we bring these two discourses together, but can we also use the means, the tools we have through digitalization to help us deal with climate change and with um, the way how we have changed our natural environment? Now, <clears throat> let's turn towards imagining our digital future. And it's always difficult to imagine something that is not here um, as yet. There is definitely a shift that is occurring from the use of natural resources and human labor that has underpinned our economy that has underpinned the way how we live to something that we can call information and capital. It's a major shift that occurs. But in terms of imagining and speculation, we have a wide variety of doing so. We have not only optimists and pessimists, utopias and dystopias, but we also have speculation among scientists, and that's fun. You know, you throw up Ideas, they may come true or not. It's a way of, of discussing. But when this is taken up by the media, it is ascribed with some kind of probability or even it's seen as something that is bound to happen and going to come. And this brings us into some kind of difficulties because the future remains uncertain. And here we have just one of the many ongoing discussions where there is no clear-cut answer as yet and a lot of room is given to collective and individual imaginations. Which way to go? It's about jobs, it's about surveillance, and these are just two books among many that deal with the topic. The Fourth Industrial Revolution, Klaus Schwab, one of the proponents of Industry 4.0, and full of optimism that new jobs will be created. But if you look at the many reports and studies that are being done on <coughs> what will be our job situations, there is no consensus whatsoever. The estimates diverge widely. Nobody knows how many jobs will be gained. Everyone agrees, yes, there will be new jobs. Uh, many jobs will be lost, but no one has a clue which jobs, where, and especially what is the timeline. When will new jobs arise, where, and what <clears throat> will be the rate uh, of change. And Surveillance, uh, this book by Shoshana Zuboff, who is an economist um, at, at, at Harvard, um, she is very pessimistic and she's taking the, the big international corporations to task, saying that we are colluding with them, uh, giving them our data, and we are all victims of surveillance. But then there's another set of questions that you may not be that familiar with, or maybe you are if you like movies like Ex Machina, um, that have to do with anxiety about our identity, what makes us human. And this movie um, is, is a very nice one because um, it, it shows um, how a young nerd who is asked by his boss to come to a farm far away from his normal workplace to meet this beautiful woman who clearly is an android. So he sees that she's an android and nevertheless to experience a certain attraction to her. And um, <clears throat> the, the movie uh, has an interesting ending, which I have no time to go into, but in the discussion maybe. But the point I want to make here is that this anxiety about our identity is a very, very old one. It comes in a new guise with the new technologies, but it's old. There are many myths from many different tribes and cultures, indigenous people around the world that deal with the fear 
can I be recognized the way how I am, or have I been transformed by magic, by a, go by a ghost, into someone else that can no longer be recognized? And <clears throat> uh, Ian McEwan's book is, uh, is, is, is a new book, Machines Like Me, again deals with it in a very intricate way to come to grips with this question, what makes us human? And how are we relating to uh, entities, to bodies that look like human but may or may not be human? So this is a very deep-seated uh, question that, uh, that arises here. Now, <clears throat> I am coming uh, towards the end because we should have a little bit of time for discussion, I hope. And I want to end with um, putting the special situation in which we find ourselves. We have these wonderful opportunities that science and technology offer to us. At the same time, many people are gripped by fear they are now receding into fake news, into the kind of movements that we see, closing borders, etc. And one way of positioning this is <clears throat> to ask the question <clears throat> between, um, where are we between hubris and, and humbleness? And this is just a reminder uh, about the power of scientific knowledge. The book, um, The Usefulness of Useless Knowledge, is a classical manifesto going back to the 30s of showing how the seeming pers useless pursuit of knowledge where you don't know the KPIs that will be needed to measure it, you don't know where it will help to bring about economic growth or innovation. And yet, uh, looking back, you can see how much usefulness it has <coughs> generated. So this is something that we have to build upon and leave space for this kind of bottom-up uh, inquiry of scientific knowledge. But then <clears throat> there is the question of hubris and humbleness, a famous picture that you all know here in Vienna, uh, housed uh, not only temporarily for an exhibition, but permanently housed in the Kunsthistorische Museum um, by Bruegel. When humankind in the midst of the Genesis was um, punished by God for the hubris, God decided to confuse their languages. So they could no longer talk to each other. They no longer understood each other. And sometimes listening to, do, to today's discussions, I feel a bit of this inability and confusion that is connected to no longer being able to talk to each other and understand uh, each other. So this is hubris, and hubris usually is one-dimensional. It asserts to know the one way forward. It makes believe or promises that the solutions are at hand. And instead, I think we need a bit more of humbleness. And humbleness starting with the question, what makes us human? and asking the, best, the, the basic question, why? Now, what makes us human? There are many answers to this, of course, that we are able to have counterfactual reasoning. We can argue which machines, at least now, cannot. I should have done that. We can imagine ourselves, we can put ourselves into the situation of another person. We have imagination creating in our mind pictures when we start reading a book of fiction that transports us to another place, into the mind of other people, etc. All this that uh, machines cannot do as yet. But are we ready for a digital self? Are we ready for the digital life where we will have a kind of doppelganger, you know, all the data that record what we do, what we are, uh, etc.? Are we able to uh, take care of this? And <clears throat> as you uh, know very well, 
the development from the first generation of rule-based algorithms to the present generation of deep learning, machine learning, where um, we have now a technological product. And we have to realize this is a tool that needs to be improved because we fail to understand the real mechanism. We see the outcome, it's successful, it's very efficient, but we don't really understand what the machine actually does. And so this is why some people, like Julia Pearl, argue we need to have um, also a new kind of mathematics also in Princeton. A group of mathematicians starts working on causal understanding. So this is one way of reminding us of uh, the humbleness that is um, needed. And regarding the way how to deal with society, I think one obligation we have is to make the invisible and much of the digital culture around us is invisible. We have devices, but we don't know what's behind it. So to make at least some of this invisible, this invisible um, kind of umwelt, to make it visible. And this starts with um, telling people that algorithms are not perfect. Algorithms have biases, but we also have to understand this is not only the white single guys in California who you know, bring their biases to the algorithms. They may do that, but there are other biases. Biases that have to do um, with errors that people are working on, but the errors are there. And also, let us not forget, there's an inherent bias in every algorithm because you have to, you can only use an algorithm for something that you can measure. And what you cannot measure is not capable of being caught by the algorithm. So these are the kind of um, interactions I think we should engage much more. And what I mean by beyond ethics is um, it's not just about ticking a box of following uh, ethic guidelines. We will have to answer questions about social justice is it possible if the machine says uh, police profiling or uh, no longer giving you the credit uh, that you want and need in order to use your credit card and many, many other day-to-day -day practices, if the machine says, no, you are out, is it possible like in any legal system to have recourse to say, no, wait a moment, you know, I want to rest my case, I want to go to the next level. These are aspects of social justice that eventually we will also have to answer. So let me just um, uh, show you one message from 100 years ago. Um, H.G. Wells, known to many of you, after the end of the First World War, he was a prolific writer. He wrote this uh, book, The Outline of History. It's a kind of world history that he wrote very quickly. But this is the end of the book where he says, human history becomes more and more a race between education and catastrophe 100 years ago. But let me also show you uh, and these are my last two slides, the view of an artist on what I have been speaking about. This is Michelangelo Pistoletto, and he came up with this symbol, which of course reminds you of infinity, and he chose it uh, because it's reminiscent of infinity. But what he means is, it's called the Terzo Paradiso, the third paradise. Slightly ironic in undertone. The first paradise here on the left <clears throat> was the state of nature. We were born into the state of nature. <clears throat> but eventually, we moved to the second paradise. We invented the artificial, we invented industry. That's what you see on the other side. But at the same time, some part of this second paradise reacted and destroyed some parts of the first paradise. And now we find ourselves here in the middle and our task is to find a balance between nature and the artificial. 
and Michelangelo Pistoletto also shows these kind of installations in other parts of the world and uses the same symbol. And I hope, if nothing else from this evening, that you take this with you. A third paradise is possible, perhaps. Thank you. Thank you.